here. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, we're live. Yep. Welcome, everyone. How are we doing? We're good. So today we are here to talk about uh, container networking at the edge with Courier. So basically the focus of our work has been to um, try to conceptualize an architecture where we can uh, deploy commute, compute nodes to the edge, uh, eventually running uh, Kubernetes on bare metal uh, and using Courier to uh, talk to, network, uh, talk to uh, neutron networking to enable networking for containers. So it requires a physical environment, distributed compute nodes. Uh, we in introduced some simulated network impairment. Uh, we'll go over the network topology. Daniel here will go over Courier and Cryo. And then we'll uh, kind of uh, summarize you know, what we're gonna do going forward and uh, save the rest for closing our remarks. So supporting workloads at the edge is becoming critical. Uh, you've heard it a thousand times here. Uh, things like lower latency, reduction of backhaul, uh, 5G, Mac, I IoT, and a thousand other use cases where proximity and latency is uh, important, uh, requiring us to look at the edge. Containers, uh, particularly Kubernetes right now, is the, the, the preferred model for deploying containers. So what we're trying to do is get containers going on the edge using the existing tooling that OpenStack has. Uh, and I should mention, I don't know if I mentioned it in the deck, we're using Queens uh, as of right now. Uh, Courier, as I already mentioned, uh, will supply the, the gateway into Neutron for supplying uh, networking for containers. So the way we rolled it out was kind of a phased uh, implementation. We racked and stacked the servers, deployed a uh, relatively vanilla stamp with uh, nine nodes, three of them being HA controllers, three computes, three storage. Um, then we configured a network impairment box that will be a man in the middle uh, to simulate uh, a WAN, basically. Uh, then we uh, set up a, a remote site with uh, a compute instance, deployed workloads there, uh, did some testing with network impairment, and the, the pieces we're working on now are getting courier integrated and hopefully get ironic at the edge so we can deploy uh, Kubernetes to bare metal. Uh, at the end of the day, we're going to close the loop in the next couple months and make everything work together. So currently, there's a lot of activity uh, inside OpenStack at the edge, in particular the uh, working group, which I'm a part of, the edge computing working group. Um, they have right now two MVPs that we're looking at. One is uh, a distributed kind of control plane, where you'd have a centralized data center. Uh, in the middle, you'd have uh, some synchronized services like Keystone. Uh, and then you would have small edge, which just, would just be running compute and neutron. Uh, the model we have is closer to the one on the right, which is a central data center and a small edge, uh, which basically looks like this without Cinder. So right now we just have uh, compute and Nova uh, and ephemeral storage for compute instances. <clears throat> So the Linux Foundation and OpenStack Foundation have a bunch of uh, projects in the works. We've got Starling X, Acrano, Airship, OpenNFV, LF Edge, ONAP. You know, you've heard a thousand of them. You've been here for the last three days. Uh, there will be more next week. I can't even keep up with them. Uh, the demand for IaaS is really good on the edge. So that's really good for OpenStack. There's lots of momentum around the edge. I think it's uh, you know, becoming a realistic thing that people need. Uh, and these projects are driving uh, OpenStack to be ahead of the curve, I think maybe even more some than some of the you know, large commercial cloud providers. Why it's bad, uh, there's a lot of confusion. I find myself, I've been working with OpenStack for years and tracking all of this stuff uh, can cause pain behind the eyes, trying to keep up with what projects are, what are doing what and where they overlap, where they don't, uh, that, get, that gets confusing. And I think there's also a lot of duplication of efforts uh, and people don't necessarily know where to pitch in, I think. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Mark. He's kind of going to go through what we have right now, uh, and then he's going to pass it off to Daniel to talk about Courier. Okay, thank you. What can we do right now? So um, 
We took a look at, well, uh, what I, I think um, Red Hat's kind of been uh, championing the name uh, distributed compute node. But basically what that is, is what we're, what we're looking at is stretching the control plane for all of the OpenStack services over a layer three link out to the edge site. So we're doing routed everything to be able to get to the edge site, the edge compute, and we're able to provision that and deploy workloads out to that. So I'll get into a few more details about what's going on there. First, to talk about a bit approach to networking. We're sticking with layer three primarily because what we wanted to make sure that we could flesh out and make sure that OpenStack was capable of doing was actually routing over a routed network. Um, there are a number of OpenStack services like Ironic, which rely on a layer two broadcast domain for things like DHCP. So once you start getting edge sites and you've got Ironic trying to pixie boot a server over layer three network, there is some plumbing that needs to be done in the form of what's called the DHCP relay. And so these are the sort of things that we set out as, as our guiding principles. Let's make sure that we're gonna do layer three all the way through and not just stretch a VLAN across to make sure that you know, absolutely everything is going to be able to be routed over a layer three network. I know there are sites where, um, you know, your aggregation site or your central office will have layer connectivity out towards edge sites, but I didn't want that to be, you know, sort of an easy way out of this situation, so. Um, also, we wanted to make sure that at the edge site, we're using um, provider networks. So what that means is whatever compute instances are running on the edge node, they're going to be talking to a network that's local to that edge node. So you're not using things like OpenStack floating IPs, which are managed up at the Neutron control plane, where the Neutron um, controller is running, essentially. Because what happens there is you're getting your traffic in at the um, central site, basically, and it's going to then send that down through a tunnel to the edge site. And if you've got traffic coming in from the edge site that has to go back to the remote data center to only to come back to itself, well, you've obviously added two hops of latency that you don't want. So best practices and whatnot is use your provider network when you're at the edge. Don't necessarily rely on the central region for your DHCP. You're probably either gonna be wanting to do static IP addressing or have your own DHCP management at the edge site. So that way you can control, like when a VM comes up and whatnot, it doesn't need to necessarily go back to the control plane just to find out its own address. Um, you can do things like inject uh, through the config data or have a site local DHCP if you want to use DHCP. But there, I have seen a number of edge workloads that basically kind of come pre-configured and they go, no, we, we want static IP addressing on a flat network so that you know, there's fewer moving parts. So some edge deployments actually prefer not having <laughs> DHCP. Um, so prototyping in our single lab required network impairment testing. We don't have miles and miles of fiber that we can use to slow things down. So we used a man in the middle VM basically that acted as a kind of a white box router. So it would have ingress ports and egress ports and we would do all of our traffic impairment on that. And I know you can do traffic impairment at the egress side of your um, nodes, but there are some slight gotchas specifically coming around to dropping packets where the stack on the kernel is a little bit too intelligent and can compensate for drop packets. So we opted for you know kind of this man in the middle VM that's gonna absolutely, you can't get to you know, from your regional data center to your edge site without going through this routed node. And we discovered with Ironic that um, provisioning the remote compute nodes over layer three absolutely does work with DHCP helper. So to go over the topology that we were using, uh, which is the button to make the little light go? Red one. Sorry, which is it? Oh, there it is. So um, here's all of our regular OpenStack services running up here at our central data center. Um, we've got our network impairment server here that's got um, two NICs, one on either side, acting as the router between the two gateways, uh, sorry, between the two um, subnets. And then we used for management IP, we used VXLAN. 
So that way it would be encapsulated over the layer three network going through here. So for the purposes of management, I want to SSH into this machine to do some sort of configuration. We would go ahead and be able to use OpenStack floating IPs that would be intercepted by the, control, the uh, no, uh, Neutron controllers up here, drop down onto the VM private IP over the VX LAN network, and go into this site here. So even for management and floating IPs for the purposes of SSH, we could simulate the latency there as well. Down on this side, what we've got is our external flat network, and we've got clients basically that can talk to that. Traffic will go into one, hit our um, workload here basically, that was a caching proxy, and then it would talk out to another interface to go out to the internet to fetch content. And what we were able to do there is simply, I mean, all this is is a caching proxy. This is the simplest sort of you know, uh, CDN or, or caching at the edge use case you could have. And um, tying that back for anyone who's seen any of the OpenStack um, edge working group sessions, this is kind of uh, uh, an implementation of one of the use cases that talks about their uh, basic minimal viable product. In the case of provisioning, very similar. We've got our triple um, O up here, which is ironic, and DHCP servers. That goes through a local provisioning network, which goes through the routed, um, uh, the router here, basically, our network impairment server, which had the DHCP relay on it. So when ironic up here would go through the out of band network, IPMI, IDRAC, whatever BMC protocol you happen to be using to fill your back end in for Ironic. It would go through, power on the node. The node down here would wake up, d request a DHCP from, which would get relayed through here back to Ironic, and we could then continue with the iPixie boot. Because of course, that at that point is, you know, sort of HTTP traffic, and so that route's no problem. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the zones or if I should just yeah, continue. Can, okay. Sure. Um, so from here, what you're going to need to do now is you're actually going to want to dedicate um, availability zones for your edge site. Because what you don't want is just to basically say, oh, I'm going to fire up a workload. And it, is it going to the edge? Is it going to my central site and whatnot? So we created um, availability zones in aggregates and created flavors, et cetera, for all of this, as well as creating our provider network at the edge. So that was a construct as well that's done through Neutron. Um, but we're using like an OVS bridge um, to talk to the actual physical adapter on the edge node. Um, Oh, so here it is. Here's where we're actually going and doing the server create. Um, you can see where it ended up on our compute nodes. There's the provider network. There's the internet. Um, in the previous slide that I had shown, uh, sorry, here, we talked about having the two, you know, the, the client side or ingress side of the network and the internet facing side. So we created this workload um, VM here with the two provider networks. One so that it could come in from this completely captive network that would represent your cell tower side or your edge side. And this one representing the um, uh, internet facing. And so this way we're able to show as well that none of the east, well, I don't know if I'd call it necessarily east-west traffic, but none of the traffic from the clients will go back to the control plane at all. It's going to be all handled here, and then whatever backhaul you use to get to the network has been shown to be a separate dedicated path as well. Um, yeah, so the, I guess so, we, we should note, right, the only backhaul there is getting the image at a glance. That's the one uh, thing that we don't have the ability to cache that at the, at the, the site. So that is one, one place there will be some backhaul involved. Okay, so to go back again to the um, edge uh, working group picture. So these here are the services basically that we are running at the control plane. And as we mentioned, Cinder is not running here, but this is basically each one of these would be what you would call a small edge site. So it's got a reduced set of services that are running, but all of your OpenStack control 
So your RabbitMQ, your whatever it is, all of your messaging. When I log in here and I say spin up a VM, that's going to be talking over the latent network down to the edge compute node to talk to the Nova controller. Uh, sorry, the Nova services there. Um, and where are we headed? So I don't know if you want it because yeah sure yeah, okay I'll let you take over for a bit because my throat's killing me. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, the the last picture was basically where we are right. We have this stuff working in the lab. We're able to reproduce it. It's, it's working good. Uh, this was like kind of um, when we're writing the abstract. What would be like the, the ultimate thing we could do uh, at the edge, right? Which you know everybody wants Kubernetes. Kubernetes on bare metal is ideal. Can we do Kubernetes uh, at the edge with what we have today in OpenStack? Uh, so basically, the, what, we, what will happen in the future is we will uh, push Ironic down to one of the edge compute nodes as a bastion, basically, into that environment, uh, and then start bare metal instances and integrate with Courier um, and deploy Kubernetes on the bare metal and, and get talking to Neutron that way. So this is our, our end goal. We're not quite there yet. Um, there's a, a few things that might be blocking. Um, that we're still in the kind of the discovery process there. Hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll get that worked out. So one thing to be clear on, and that is this is two distinct uses of Ironic. The first one that we were showing was using Ironic to deploy the bare metal node in order to be able to receive an OpenStack deployment. So that was sort of the Vim layer deployment where we're putting you know, a, a compute personality on there. This variant of Ironic is where you're using Ironic as an OpenStack service, and instead of spinning up a VM, you're actually going to provision a bare metal node. So for those that aren't aware of the sort of two ways that you can use Ironic, that's what we're talking about in this second instance here. Right, and to the, to the overcloud, uh, you know, at the control plane, if you did an OpenStack server list, you would see all of these basically on equal ground. So bare metal instances would just be like a VM uh, in, in you know, in basic terms. Oops, I didn't. I forgot we had the limitations going on here, but that's okay. You, uh, okay. Uh, so limitations in this uh, prototype. So uh, control plane communication latency. So what we've learned with this distri distributed compute um, node framework is that if you get past 100 milliseconds. Uh, round trip to the control plane, bad things start to happen. Uh, you start to lose messages. Uh, you know, basically, uh, that's like the, the, the line in the sand is 100 milliseconds, which is a, a pretty decent amount of time. Well, yeah, but are arguably things can start to look a little wonky around 50 milliseconds, but we found uh, 100 to be truly the, upper, truly the upper limit where you don't want to push things beyond. So. Uh, and the other limitations I already mentioned, uh, compute and networking are only thus, uh, been explored so far, just ephemeral storage for compute. There's no persistent storage, no Ceph, uh, no Cinder uh, at the edge. But it looks like um, those things are going to roll out very soon. In uh, triple O, they're gonna, uh, you're going to be able to have multiple Ceph clusters, so there's no reason you couldn't deploy a, a small Ceph cluster at this edge site and do persistence there if you wanted to. My feeling, um, you know, I don't know all the workloads, but my feeling is most workloads are going to be ephemeral anyways, but um, I could, you know, totally be wrong. Uh, if the link to the control plane goes down, your workloads will continue to run, but, but that's about it, right? It's, uh, there's no communication to OpenStack anymore. So until that link comes back up, you're not going to be able to do anything. You're not going to be able to shut down that instance uh, through uh, the APIs. It's basically uh, on its own until it comes back up. I'm going to give you the network oh, impairment yes. stuff. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, OK, so uh, simulating the network impairment. I think I went through a little bit of this already. But um, so to simulate uh, the real world latency, um, we needed simulated network impairment. So all of our layer 3 traffic was told to use the impairment box as a gateway. So, I mean, in, in this typical lab environment that we have, I mean, what we're, what we're talking about there is I've got one 10 gig inbound and one 10 gig outbound. So that's not necessarily going to scale and you're not going to be able to do reasonable throughput and performance testing with something like that. But for the purposes of simulating latency, slower links than 10 um, gigabit and things like that, it works really well. Um, 
any of the layer two networking. So in the case of uh, certain VLANs, like say, for example, the Ceph storage, um, that one typically tends to like having one layer two domain for all of its replication traffic. And we didn't actually you know, want to ex try and extend Ceph out to the edge node, so we didn't bring the VLAN out there. But if we did and we wanted to do some sort of testing of latency there, you would actually have to go onto the node, into like each you know, controller node or each Ceph node, and set your impairment on the outbound interface of that. So there are ways of being able to test uh, layer three, or sorry, layer two um, connectivity, you know, basically by impairing the network interface in kernel. Um, and that's a fairly simple thing that we were able to set up as well. Um, we did play around a little bit with, you know, the um, uh, putting latency in between different nodes on the control on the control plane and sort of see what happened there. But that's obviously not something that you would be doing in a real world. So, um, yes. Was there any ideas or thoughts around using iSCSI instead of Pixie Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so to go back to um, the ironic side of things, so when it's deploying a, um, so when it's deploying the glance image basically um, to the bare metal node in order to be able to start it up in the first time, um, there's a couple different transports that can be used for that. Um, so after the initial Pixie, I, I Pixie boot happens, it's got to pull down all of the bits for the hard drive, and I mean, that can be fairly large. And the default mechanism that it uses is called iSCSI, and that's just sort of like a bitwise copy, and it's not exactly um, the most tolerant when it comes to network outages and whatnot. Um, there is a way of deploying images from Ironic where you use a Swift store instead, and because that's over HTTPS, that's going to be a lot easier to do a retry and restart and things like that from. So that is one of the things, thank you for bringing that up, that is one of the things that we forgot to put in the consideration slide, is that um, there are some transport issues when it comes to deploying images over a latent network to an edge site that need to be considered as well. Um, so yeah, this is basically simply the way we set it up, from our external network into the OpenStack control plane, and then everything from there, other than uh, we actually have some um, local compute nodes that are inside of this you know, OpenStack control plane, but um, everything from there all the way down to the edge, no matter which edge node we were using, we had everything running through this impairment box so that it could act as the router and we could drop the network, inject um, packet delay, jitter, um, duplication, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, that's how we basically proved out this environment. And over to, uh, yes, okay. to get the right button. Thanks. So let me go a little bit uh, in a quick way to what Career is and why we want to use Career to liberate workloads between the edge network and the core network. So first of all, just in case you are not familiar with Career, so uh, it's, um, we got this fancy mascot. With, uh, we have some colleagues who do some fancy rhymes with this. Even some of those are here in the audience right now. And we started out with this first bit, and it's a, basically a courier because we are just sitting down in between Kubernetes and OpenStack, and we are providing um, seamless um, networking experience in between two of those. We have been uh, part of the, uh, uh, well, there's a OpenStack project called Courier, which we got several ones, but the most safety in development is called Courier Kubernetes. It's mainly written in Python, although we are migrating some parts of it to Golang and it's called Career Kubernetes on, 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 on PIP. So we got some contributors for companies such as Red Hat, Huawei, Intel, Samsung, and quite a few uh, also contributors. Uh, it has been around since the OpenStack Queens release uh, with the first version, but nowadays we have just released the first, the first stable version in Stein, which is the 1.0. And we are usually following the cycle with intermediary release model, although this is a little bit tricky because we have got to, got to take also Kubernetes releases in consideration. So what are our goals? So basically we want to provide a seamless experience in terms of networking in between OpenStack and Kubernetes. And in order to do so, we have a CNA plugin 
for just in case you don't know, the CNA plugin is a plugin that hooks up into Kubernetes networking and gets you all the networking, all the fancy networking under the hood. Uh, and we also interact with Neutron. Um, that way, we can provide Neutron ports directly to the pods and to whatever Kubernetes objects that you might want to to check it out. So basically, we are providing uh, certain, we are providing ports to pods, and also we are getting um, Octavia load balancers to um, to match Kubernetes services. Basically, we want to get the power of Neutron directly into Kubernetes, but that has a few caveats. So we have the sun, you need to star, black hole, and then Neutron. So if you take the whole Neutron there, it could be just mainly a little bit too much. So what we are doing in order to help with this is that we are taking only what we want from Neutron. So not everything, just a little tiny bit. So uh, we want to provide basically connectivity between pod and VMs and for, in order for it to be seamless to you and VM services. That basically, and the main motivation of this is to avoid the double overlay. Because if you think as of now, this is what would be happening without Kubernetes. So you would be having like a, a neutron on one side, Flannel or OpenShift as the end or whatever on the other side. So getting packages from one world to the other world wouldn't be really efficient because you would be having to deal with the double encapsulation. So we leverage that, and as we are just speaking with Neutron directly, you get rid of that because everything goes back to Neutron and gets directly hooked up into OpenBSH or OVM, but that's another, another topic. So we are also supporting like uh, nested, with, uh, nested mode, which is like you will be having Kubernetes on top of OpenStack VMs. Um, that would be also allowing you to get some hybrid environments and also with bare metals. So, we have, well, here I used to the three, but there are mainly I want to go quickly over the two different main query uh, Kubernetes components. So we have query CNI, which is one CNA plugin. Mainly, this is really seamless and basically just hooks up whatever Kubernetes tells you to, to do in terms of networking to, to our controller. This is mainly currently written in Python, although we want to switch this to Golang for the next release. So if there's any volunteer for that, feel free to take that over. Um, then we got the query controller, which acts a little bit like a tiny Kubernetes controller, but written into Python and within OpenStack. So we got quite a few documentation there. Um, we are on um, OpenStack Dask Courier. We are always on the upstream channel, so feel free to join if you want to. Besides that, I also wanted to speak a little bit about Cryo, because you could have been seeing that a lot of times as a recently, but what the hell is this Cryo thing? So if you're familiar with Docker, so there are more ways to, to run containers rather than Docker. Docker were one of the first that started that, but then suddenly a lot of those just went around. So you could run C, Arc, Rocket, CNI Container D, whatever. And they all wanted to follow the OCI implementation, but they were mainly lacking uh, a way to interface with some organizer and orchestrator. So then, then the, there was, the response to that was getting a standard API to handle them all, and this is the container runtime interface, CRI, then Cryo comes from that. And it's since 2018, it's an official part of the Kubernetes. So you can just run directly um, containers without having to leverage onto the Docker daemon. There are some uh, benefits of, out of doing so, and I'll go, quickly go through that. So first of all, it's an open source project. So Docker might or might not be. So and we, there's contributors over the open source companies such as Red Hat, SUSE, Intel, Google, IBM, and so forth. It's more secure because as of now, uh, when you are running Docker containers, they, the, all the processes are just child, children of the big fat Docker daemon, and that's not really secure using. Uh, just cry oh, yeah, it, it's done in such a way that uh, they are independent process. It's much more lightweight because you can just have it around, and you, don't, you are not having this big fat Docker daemon around. And um, well, and it's an official Kubernetes project. Alongside Cryo, there are two, let's say, tight projects which I would like to speak about a little bit, which is Podman and Builder. Those two projects are also closely tight, and in such a way that Podman is basically the CLI for Builder. So what do they do? So Builder allows you to just to to have a Kubernetes cluster without any Docker daemon around, and it's just mainly being used to create images. Uh, 
they replicate all the commands that you might have into a Docker file. So if you're familiar with that, you can just go and use uh, build it directly. And Podman, it's just a CLI. So whenever you are using, if you are familiar with yes, using Docker, let's say you want to do list all the containers, Docker PS A, you can just do an alias to, from uh, Docker to Podman, and it will just work. So you can just get the alias, and it does be the same for you. Podman will call build that under the hood, and it will work. So I just wanted to go with a quick demo, so hold on. And yes, this is going to be a bit of a live demo, so you know, let's, <laughs> let's all pay respect to the demo uh, deities for a moment here. Well, so if it fails, <laughs> uh, we'll blame Neutron, so no worries. Yeah, go ahead. So let me just rephrase it. I might not be clear. So what Greek Kubernetes allows you to do is just to use Neutron for everything. So whenever you spin up a pod, it'll just get a Neutron port. And for OpenStack, it'll just be Neutron ports. So let's say you got some Ironic with some Neutron port, an OpenStack installation with some VS with Neutron ports. And using Greek Kubernetes, the networking in between such pods and VMs and bare metal would be just seamless because they will all be Neutron ports. I can, after the session, I can go with you through the documentation so far, but that's just a high level overview. <coughs> Sorry? No. Yeah, is Kata containers okay, supported so, well, I mean, trial? I'm not involved into Kata containers at all, so I can't answer that so, to you. So, so let me ask yeah, you. go ahead. So in any case, Eric, I hope that this demo would serve you to have a much better still overview. You still sound slides, Daniel. No, no worries. I'm not okay. there. I'm just okay. You. I thought you were starting it already, and we're like, eh, so, we're not seeing okay. it. Let me know if you can see this. There clearly. it is. Clearly, I can see a thing. Okay. Okay, let me go through this. Is it okay, or do I make it bigger? How about you guys? Can you see it? Okay. So first, uh, what I'm going to do in this demo is first, I'm gonna just go and create one network policy in Kubernetes, which uh, is gonna get mapped to security groups and security group rules in OpenStack because I need to open some ports for the next work. So this is just one simple network policy that would open the AT and the AT-AT ports in ingress and would open everything when it comes to ingress. Let's go apply it. What we do under the hood is that we are creating a CRA, which is called Query Network Policy, that has all the things, and we also fetch all the IDs from Neutron. There it is. So we got this query net policy. You see that around there, it has all the security group IDs. So let's double check this in OpenStack. Okay, there it is. Let's see the rules. Okay, so there we go. This would just get mapped to your usual security group rules. So let's do something with this. Let's go and create a one deployment. We are using this career slash demo, which is something that we use in testing, and it has just a simple server that would reply, hello, I'm alive. So this is created. Let's see if it's ready. Okay, not yet. Wait, come on. There you go. So that AP 
it's the IP that gets directly from a neutron port. Let's take the port. And there we go. Now let's try to call it directly. This is just calling a direct pod. It's alive, okay, but let's go to the next level. Let's scale our deployment. So we would be having to have one load balancer as well. Okay. Now I'm going to expose the service. So we will be having one VAP, which would be just mapping um, everything on the port 80 to the 8080 and load balancing it. That is being done using OpenStack load balancer, which is basically Octavia, and we'll go through that as well. So that's the service, just got created. We got that VAP, and let's try to check that in OpenStack as well. There we go. Okay. So now you can see that uh, we got, that is replying back, but we are doing that again, and the other one was replying. So that's Octavia under the hood. How about Creo? I spoke a lot about Kubernetes, what it is, but, uh, and I've been spinning up a lot of containers, but uh, I didn't get to speak much about Creo. So here in this setup, there's no Docker daemon at all, and every container that has been going through that has been just gotten through Podman. So I told you before, you can just go and exchange Podman for Docker, it'll work. And you can alias that too. And there was no harm here into Docker. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, and I want to finish because I don't want to go too long, we are running out of time. Why do we want this for the use case? Because, uh, for instance, we were working in a EU H2020 project called Superfluidity not too long ago, which has involved Edge staff, and we want to have crew around to shift workloads from core network VMs to Edge network pods. And this way, it would be seamless for you to have a single network solution for that while keeping all the performance. And I guess that for engine and staff, I'm just gonna be trying to get rid of those. Okay. I don't see a thing, I guess, too many hours of laptop. <laughs> oh, here. So, go ahead, Dave. Cool. Thank you, Daniel. So, next steps. I think we're, yeah, we're getting very close on time. Uh, so, we're going to complete the carrier integration at the edge. Um, one of the things that's uh, not necessarily a blocker, but is, is um, a problem, I think, is that Octavia is a, a pretty heavy lift uh, and requires a lot of services to be deployed down at the edge in order to get it to work. Um, I don't have a, a ton of information on there yet, but that's what I'm, I'm seeing. Um, so we're looking for a lighter weight way of, of doing that, uh, that, that piece of doing load balancing without having to require Octavia. Uh, deploy Ironic down at the edge to support bare metal instances um, and perhaps migrate away from using a, a site local DHCP server to using config data where we can pipe a um, IP uh, right into the instance when it comes up at CloudInit. Um, that's something we're exploring. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully by train Shanghai, we'll be able to demo, um, you know, the, the second topology I showed you, which is bare metal Kubernetes leveraging Neutron, which would be good, I think. Uh, that is all I had, and we have two minutes for questions and answers, according to my timer. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. I, I think you might have just answered my first question. I was going to ask how much of the Octavia Courier stuff is done committed as a release vehicle and all that. Well, his demo just leveraged it, so it works somewhere. But, okay, uh, well, I see, I saw it working yeah. somewhere. Yeah, 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 uh, so I, I've just started to scratch the surface there, actually. So, okay. so basically, what we are having is where we, in Kubernetes, we have two main processes. We have drivers and handlers. The handlers react from events from Kubernetes and driver do the thing. So we have a handler for services, so whenever we get a services event in, mm -hmm. From, from Kubernetes, we are creating the load balancer under the hood. Got so it. if you are interested in the low level details, I can go with you, no worries. Cool, um, I have interest for joining up with another project, but I would actually say that the argument for sticking with Octavia is the feature set. I, it's a heavy lift, I, I get it, but yeah, in it's a case, lot of features compared to well, yeah. Kubernetes built in. But that's something balance. that we got 
uh, I mean, we are aware of that, and we have a few ideas about how to enhance it. For instance, so far we were creating one of table load balancer per service, but that could be reused, so you wouldn't have to have several VNs per service. Another one is yes to have OVN uh, acting as a east-west load balancer while only having Octavia as a north-south. But I, I can walk you through, no worries. Cool, cool. Good stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I'm curious, um, what are some of the problems or issues that you faced with the controller plane communications of 100 milliseconds? Uh, message problems, uh, what were other, some of the other things? Uh, yeah, so basically your things like your Nova um, database, the, 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 the uh, control planes version of Nova can get out of sync with um, the, the edge. Same thing with networking and things like that. So any of the periodic heartbeats that go back and forth can end up with an inconsistency. Uh, secondly, you're going to start to lose your messaging. So if you're doing something like scaling up a VM, you want to you know, go to two or you want to fire up a new one, it's going to be hit or miss as to whether or not the command completes successfully. And, the RPC sorry? The RPC channel. The RPC channel, yeah. So uh, it, depending upon how much there is, I mean, sometimes the message gets through, but there's a timeout waiting on the ACK. So it happened in the real world, but the database at the control plane hasn't been updated, and there's another mismatch, and you gotta wait for polling intervals and things like that to catch up on it and try and do some reconciliation. And if you jack up the timeout at Rabbit, you're gonna cause a bunch of other, other issues, right? <laughs> yes. Um, just wanted to know about uh, Magnum uh, in Co Korea. If uh, Magnum allows you to use bone Kubernetes clusters with... with uh... Yeah, but Magnum is basically orchestration. Well, while we, we Kubernetes doesn't care about orchestration, although I, if I recall correctly, the Magnum guys have something about setting the ass up with them, but we are just a man in the middle. I mean, we are just reacting to events and doing stuff, so we are no orchestration at all. That's a different goal for the project. Okay, so, uh, and, and do, do you guys uh, use a Magnum on, in your uh, setup, and does Magnum... Uh, lose not really, at least not yet. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. No other questions? All right. Well, well thank you very coming. much. I appreciate Thanks you uh, hanging in there. Everybody's tired, I'm sure.